raise your standards. Ultimately, if you're going to have lasting change in anything, you're really talking about just raising your standards. I mean, I always tell people, if you want to know how to change your life, I give it to you in three words, boring as it sounds, raise your standards. And what does that mean? Corny as it sounds, raise your standards. Well, thank you for the breakthrough thought, Tony. I'm glad I wasted my time watching this little email with you. But think about it. Lasting change is different than a goal. You don't always get your goals, but you always get your standards. Maybe it would help you is to think about it this way. I, I try to explain standards to people with a different set of words. Think of it as everybody in life gets their musts. They don't get their shoulds. Like, think about it. Most people have a list of shoulds, don't they? Don't you have a list of the shoulds, things you should do, you should follow through on? I, I should lose some weight, I should work out more, I should make more calls, I should respond more rapidly to my email, whatever, you know? I should get into the office earlier, I should be, you know, more confident. Whatever your should list is, people love to have their should list make, be met, but it's kind of like New Year's resolutions. If it does, it's really exciting, but if it doesn't, which is most of the time, eh, it's a little disappointing, but you kind of know it's not going to happen. But when you decide something is a must for you, an absolute must, when you cut off any possible, you say, I'm going to find the way or I'm going to make the way. Human beings, when they resolve things, when they make a real resolution inside themselves, which is they raise the standard and they make it a must, they find the way. Think about it in your own life. Haven't you had some area of your life where you raise your standard and your life has never been the same? Maybe at one time in your life you smoked cigarettes or you did something and you did it for years and you kept trying to change it, trying to change it and kept telling yourself I should. And then one day something happened. Something just clicked you over. Something took you over that kind of tipping point. And inside yourself you said no more. And it was a very, very different experience, wasn't it? Something inside of you shifted and what was a should became a must and you've never gone back. Is there an area like that in your life you can think of? Again, did you ever smoke cigarettes? Did you ever eat a certain way, drink a certain form of alcohol, and then finally say no more, and you just don't go back? And notice this, it doesn't really take any willpower anymore. Because somewhere when we make this click, when we make something a must, we attach ourselves to it. It becomes part of our identity. One thing I've learned in the last, gosh, 33 years of working with people from now over 100 countries, 4 million people, is human beings absolutely follow through on who they believe they are. If you say, said to me, well, I'm really gonna work hard to stop smoking, but you know, I've been a smoker my whole life and I'm, you know, I am a smoker. I know your days are numbered. You're gonna be back smoking cigarettes again because we all act consistent with who we believe we are. I tell people the strongest force in the whole human personality is this need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. If you define yourself as somebody who is really conservative, you're not gonna be crazy and act nuts unless you're really drunk or something, and then you can say it's the alcohol, when it's really just you finally getting permission to be yourself, the alcohol is your excuse. If you're a really crazy person, you act crazy, outrageous, playful. You don't act conservative because that's not who you are. Very often people say, well, I can't do that, I'm not that kind of person, and I always say to people, really, when did you define yourself? I mean, really, how many years ago did you come up with what you could and couldn't do in your life? How many years ago? Most people, if they really look at how they're living their life today, it's based on a set of standards, a set of beliefs that they made choices about 10, 20, 30 or more years ago. I mean, very often we made decisions in our youth or very young about what to believe, about what we were capable of, about who we are as a person, and that becomes the glass ceiling, if you will, that controls us. There's a, a corny metaphor, but it's true. I remember one time I was with my family at the circus and there was a person there and they had this big giant elephant. And you look at this elephant and they take this little rope, put it around the elephant's neck and they drive this stake into the ground. And I mean, you look at this and you know that elephant could rip down the entire tent with almost no effort. And yet the elephant doesn't struggle, doesn't try. Why? Because the elephant's conditioned. And they take that elephant, condition the elephant when it's a baby elephant. That's how they train him. When it's a little baby elephant and it doesn't have the power yet, they put a big rope around it and they drive this huge stake in the ground and the elephant fights and fights and fights. And one day, finally, that elephant decides, I'm not capable of pulling this out. And once that becomes the definition of an identity of anyone, an elephant in this case, they don't even try anymore. It's just who I am, that's how it is, that's just the way it is in my life. 
I'd like to ask you to take a look at any place you've got a limitation and ask yourself, when did I decide to accept that limitation? And you may not even see it as a limitation. You might see it as just, that's who I am. But so often in our lives, we've adapted to be a certain way so that we don't fail or so that people will like us or respect us, but it's not necessarily who we are. Joy comes when you're spontaneous. It's really hard to be truly happy when you're not being yourself. And most of us have no clue who we are. And so a big part of my work, if you've ever been to an event, you know, is to get people to do things spontaneously without thinking, because that's when the real you shows up. That's when the energy comes alive. And when you do that, when you start to connect your true nature, suddenly there's energy available for you to set a higher standard for what you want in your life. That's what this is really all about. And when I talk about standards, when I talk about, you know, shoulds versus musts, think about your own life. I know there have been areas in your life where some point in time you just shifted and you raised the standard and your life changed. Because whatever people have their identity attached to, they live. We live who we believe we are. That's just how it works. It's just kind of like, I'll give you an example. Look at your physical body. Your physical body today is an absolute reflection of only one thing. Not your goals, not your desires, but your standards the identity you have for yourself. If your standard is you're an athlete, then there's a certain amount of strength, a muscle tone, and energy that's available in your body on a regular basis because that's who you are. And so you do whatever's necessary to maintain that identity. Again, the strongest force in the human personality is this need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. Because if you don't know who you are, you wouldn't know how to act. Once you lock in on that identity, your brain finds a way to keep you there. If you say, uh, you know, man, I've, I'm overweight, I've always been overweight, I'm big boned, and that's the story you've got, then you're gonna always find a way to get back there. That's your settling point. That's your identity. That's where things lock in. If you see somebody who's in really great shape, you ask them, do you work out? You know the answer, yes, how often? And they'll tell you three times, four times, five times a week, whatever. In a seminar, I'll ask people, who here works out at least five days a week? And I'm stand up. And you look around that room, and you know that they work out five times a week because you can see their body. You don't just get a result without some kind of action, without some form of ritual. Ritual meaning actions you do consistently. Now, do you think of those people that are out there working out five days a week, do they have more time than you do? Or I have, or anybody else? Of course not. Is their life less busy? Of course not. It's just a must for them. They must work out that way, and they've made that turn, and their life changed. So I'm not saying you have to work out five days a week. I'm just saying whatever you really want, wants don't get met consistently, standards do. Whatever you identify, this is who I am. And so it's not so much about changing your identity as there's expanding it. You know, deciding that, you know, instead of your goal is to lose 10 pounds, which is not compelling, what if your vision was to get back to my fighting weight? You know, this, this year, this month, this next 90 days, I'm gonna transform my body. I'm gonna take on a new challenge. I'm gonna find some technique or strategy, there's a million of them that can reframe myself where I want to feel younger, stronger, more vibrant than ever before. Here's my reasons, because I want the energy to really make my life work. Because it's tough out there and I want to be stronger than I've ever been before. I want to go in front of the mirror and if I'm naked, not, you know, want to laugh. I want to look there and take a good look and go, yeah, <laughs> I'm proud of whatever I see there. Whatever it takes, something's going to make you laugh, smile, something's going to tease yourself, but something's going to move you to another level. If you identify yourself in a new way, and you own that every day, and that becomes the standard of how you live, you'll find the way to make that standard real. Money's the same way. Think about it, it doesn't matter what's happening, quote unquote, in the marketplace. People that make money find a way to make money no matter what, don't they? I mean, most people's standard is to pay their bills. So that's what most people find a way to do, even when economic times get tough. Most people, if that's their absolute standard, they find a way. Some people's standard is pay their bills most of the time. And so most of the time they do. Some people's standard is not just to pay their bills, but to take care of their family and maybe even some of their friends. And they find a way. In fact, you know, some people may be in a family where they don't have enough money. They barely have money to pay their bills. They work their guts out. And then somebody, their mother, their father, somebody else, their sister gets ill and there's not enough money to take care of it. Nobody else has money in the family. They don't either, but they find a way to get that money to take care of their mother or father, don't they? And pay their bills. They never could do it before, why? The situation made them raise their own standard. And not everybody does that. Somebody else in the family might have money and still not take care of their mother. 
It all comes down to the inner game, my friends. Changing your life is a change in the inner game. The outside world you can't control, but you have absolute control over this one if you learn the dynamics of what shapes you. And identity is one of those simple, clear, fundamental basics that if you start, start to shift it, everything else will shift in your life as well. Some people, by the way, have to have more than enough money to do what they want, when they want, where they want, with whomever they want, contribute the way they want. And if that's their must, they find a way. I know that sounds overly simplistic, but it's true. You know, somebody once said, you can take all the money in the world out of the hands of everybody, out of all the wealthy people in the world who are really successful, give it to other people. It wouldn't take too long. Those people would have it back in their hands. It's not because they're manipulative. It's because they have a standard. Some are manipulative, don't get me wrong, but they've got a standard of what they're going to find a way to make happen. I'm just simply saying to you, take those three magic words and live them. Raise your standard. As most people are not really entrepreneurs, but they think that's what they should be. They think that's the sexy thing, that's the most attractive thing, that's the best answer. And what I say to you is, you gotta separate the vehicle from the outcome. What is it that's gonna truly fulfill you? What is it that's gonna give you that extraordinary life? What's gonna make things magnificent on your terms, not somebody else's terms, not your father, your mother, your background? What is that really? Separate the vehicle, because there's many ways to get that vehicle. But I'm saying, sometimes you gotta reevaluate what's gonna really make you fulfilled. What is your gift? Are you an artist? Are you the talent that can produce something no one else produces as a skill or a product or a service or some impact? Are you incredibly good at management? You really know how to manage or lead people. Are you an extraordinary entrepreneur that has, can take that gigantic gut load of risk and can create the vision and attract the talent that you need and the managers and leaders? You may have all three abilities, but which one really fulfills you the most? is going to be the critical question. Because we tend to want to do them all, especially in a room like this, because you're all overachievers, right? Me too. And you say, well, I can do all these. Yes, you can, but what will it do to your quality of life? See, again, the secret's going to be this. What is an extraordinary life on your terms today? Getting things is not going to make you happy. That's good news in a tough economy. It's a good reminder. You know, it doesn't matter what you get. It doesn't matter whether it be money or opportunity. All those things might excite you for the moment. You know, even a relationship, as magnificent it may be, might be exciting for a while. But if you don't keep growing, that relationship isn't going to stay exciting. So the secret to real happiness is progress. Progress equals happiness. And if we can make progress on a regular basis, we feel alive. And that's why at the beginning of the year, we get this thing like, okay, I can have this fresh start. I can really do what my soul desires. I can expand. I can grow. I can improve. I can change. Or maybe better than change, I could progress. See, think about that. Progress is an aliveness to it, doesn't it? You don't have to work at changing. People say all the time, now, well, I'm, I'm working on changing. Don't worry about it. You don't have to work on changing. Change is automatic. Your body's gonna change whether you want it or not as the years go by. And no matter how hard you work, there's gonna be some changes going on there. The economy is gonna change no matter what you want it to do. The weather is gonna change. Relationships are gonna change. Everything in life is always changing. We don't have to work on change. Change is automatic, but progress is not. So if you wanna make real progress, then you really gotta look at your life in a different way. You gotta say, I gotta take control of this process and not just hope it's gonna work out like people do who make a resolution. people at the end of the relationship like it's the beginning and there won't be an end. And that's not just your intimate relationship. What if your customers, what if you fell in love with your customers, with your clients more than your product, more than your company? If your entire life was about meeting their needs, if you would do what for your customers and clients, you would do what? If you love your customers and clients, you do anything, guess what? They're going to love you. But most people love their customers and clients as long as they buy from them, do what they want, respond to them. And when they don't, they go, that's the end. You want clients for life, not just customers? Fall in love with them. It's a different focus, isn't it? It's a different meaning. And that creates a different life because you make decisions differently from that place. You've made this whole business about meeting your needs. You can run a successful business, but it'll be a job because you'll never be able to sell it. Because if it's just meeting your needs, it's not a system. It demands your 
attention, your connection. It's giving what you want, but ultimately it's not gonna give somebody else what they want so you can't sell it. If you can't sell your business, if you don't have an exit strategy, you have a job. I don't care how successful the business is. That doesn't mean you have to sell the business, but one of the most important decisions you make in business is, ultimately, if I was gonna sell this, if I chose to, I have to know who what I sell this to so that I have long-term value, not just an income along the way, I have this critical mass hit. I get a multiple of my business. And most people don't have a clear exit strategy. They think I'll come up with that someday. You gotta start with that end in mind. That's gotta be part of your focus if you're gonna be successful in your business. I can remember um, a gentleman who's built CAA in Hollywood, his largest, most successful agency, right? Michael Ovitz, remember that name? He put together Nike and Coca-Cola and these billion dollar deals. And eventually Mike Ovitz went to go sell that business. He'd never thought through an exit strategy and he got almost nothing for it. Because the laws prevented him from selling it to a studio. He had to sell it to some of his employees for pennies on its real value. Now Mike found a way to make money later on in another place off of Disney. But the bottom line is the guy didn't have an exit strategy. And it was brilliant, made lots of money in the end, didn't get the value. Whenever people fail to achieve their goals 99.9% .9 of the time, and you ask them why, they'll tell you it's because of a lack of resources. That's what all these things are. I didn't have the support, right? I didn't have the money, we didn't have the time, we didn't have this, we didn't have that. There's a resource that people believe is missing. And that resource, belief structure, then keeps people from ever being able to really lead. Because what leaders do is they find a way to maximize whatever resources they have, as little as they may be, and they don't believe in limited resources. I'll give you an example. Let's take a business example to start with. In 1974, a guy named Sam Walton had built his little company up. He came up with an idea. He started with $20,000 in, I think, 1962, if I remember right. But by 1974, within 12 years, he had 78 stores. And you know how he did it? In the middle of the night, he'd drive across the border, and he'd go and study other people's stores He'd buy everything the cheapest he could in the middle of the night. He'd go to the people's stores. Whatever was working, he figured out. Success leaves clues. He came back and did it in his store. Whatever was working in any store, in any competitor, anywhere he could do it, he did it. So he figured out how to maximize the little resources he had. His 20,000, built 78 stores. And if you read any of the people following him, the company had gone public in that year, they were all saying, this is it. He's maximized his resources. I mean, he only has so much money. There's only so many cities that are going to appeal to this discounting mentality, right? This is it. This is all he can do. And the word on Wall Street was sell. Now, what's interesting is at that time, you look at Sears and Kmart, and they were gargantuan companies, weren't they? 20, 30, 40, 50 times, 100 times his size or more, probably. And at that time, they were the leaders, and they knew what's going to happen. But did things change, yes or no? Did he suddenly get mass amounts of capital? No. Here's what they didn't understand. Sam Walton now, or the Walton organization, Walmart, is the most successful retailing operation on earth. And when you talk about Bill Gates being the richest man in the world, that's only true because Sam's fortune is divided up amongst a bunch of different family members. You put them together, they dwarf Bill Gates. Sam Walton did this. How did he do it? What people underestimated is that this guy could go to 4,400 stores, do 250 billion. Where's Kmart today? And they've been shrinking, all of them have been shrinking. And he's the dominant force on earth. Here's the thing he understood. Resources are interesting, but the ultimate resources are the feelings of emotion that make you resourceful. Think of it this way. Resourcefulness is the ultimate resource. What do I mean? What are the emotions that make all this possible? What's the fuel that takes an idea from being in your head where you intellectually know what to do? How many have had an idea, for example, was a great idea, you're excited about it, and then you didn't do anything. One day, there you saw it on the shelf, you saw it somewhere, someone stole your idea. How many have had this happen? Say, I. The only difference between you and that person was not that they had more resources, they were more resourceful. Success and failure are not giant events. They don't just show up. You don't just suddenly become successful or suddenly have this cataclysmic event that makes you fail. It may look that way, but failure comes from all the little things. It's failure to make the call. It's failure to check the books. It's failure to say, I'm sorry. It's failure to push yourself to do things physically that you don't want to do. And all those little failures day after day come together until one day some cataclysmic event happens and you blame that. That event happened because you missed all the little stuff. Do you agree with me?
And success, by the way, is not some overnight event. It's all these little things. Success is having a vision. Success is making it compelling. Success is really seeing it, feeling it every day with strong enough reasons. Success is feeling the sense that I'm here to grow and I'm here to give something to the world more than just myself. All the little stuff, that's where success comes from. In business, it comes from delivering more than anybody could imagine. All those little things add up, people go, wow, that's who I want to do business with. It's true in any area of your life. Leverage is critical. You know how I get so much done? Because I don't just get it done. I know the outcome, I know the purpose, and I look for leverage. Leverage is different than delegation. What's the problem with delegation? Delegation is you have all that needs to be done, so you give it to someone else, and you tell them what needs to be done, and when they don't do it, you're pissed off. Leverage says, I can move the biggest boulder in the world with a little bit of effort if I get something I can do it with, and I'm still part of it. So leverage is, if I'm going to leverage something here with Tom, I'm going to make sure Tom understands the what? The outcome. I want to make sure Tom understands the the purpose, the why, and the action, but I might say to Tom, if you can get this done without this action or better action, go for it, baby. And I want to talk to you on this date, and we got a promise that we're going to check in before it's needed. So there's no surprises. And if you're having problems, Tom, come back to me, because we're partners on this. That I call leverage. And you know what I do when I have no time? There is time. I just got to leverage it. And I'm saying, say, I have no one to leverage it to. You know, Shane over here, right? I got all the stuff he wants to do, he can't leverage it. But Shane's answer was, Hire somebody, then he thinks about what it's going to take and goes $125,000. Can't do that now. He's getting caught up in one way to get the outcome. Leverage. He goes to his list and goes, what if I got somebody to do 20% of this stuff? I got, I could spend 20 grand to get that much freedom. I could pay for it times 10. Hmm. And if I'm really productive, my productivity should enhance the world, not only my clients and customers, but it should provide jobs for other people. And if there's anything you hate to do, it's because you're either ineffective at it or you don't think it's very important, but it is urgent. So you need to hire somebody for those things. And ideally, somebody who loves that job. You're never going to grow when your time is eaten up for activities that aren't that important. Activity without high levels of purpose is the drain of your fortune. Do it now. If you can't get it all now, do a part of it now. Leverage is power. Leverage is ultimate power. what I've created for my life and anyone I know succeeded. I'm a 17-year-old kid from Azusa, California, with no real education other than self-education, with no background, with parents that did their best, all of them, with no money, but I did one thing. I love people, and I had an enormous demand I made upon myself, and I sculpted my mind and my emotions to get me to do whatever it would take to achieve and to contribute. But to do that, I did it by using my body and changing my focus. I did it by putting myself in a peak physiology and using what I call incantations. Can you train yourself to believe something, yes or no? Absolutely. How many of you ever made the fatal mistake of going to Disneyland or Disney World, and while you're there made the fatal mistake of going to a ride called It's a Small World After All? What happens for about a week after you're out of that damn place? You're still singing this thing in your head in 24 languages, right? Well, let me tell you something. How many of you have things when you want to go achieve them and this part of your voice goes, oh, it's not going to happen or forget it? How many got a voice that sometimes interrupts that good pattern? Say, I. And what you want to do is train a new one. So starting when I was 17, I started doing incantations, not affirmations. Affirmation, you go, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. What's the problem? You haven't changed your what? Your what? Physiology. If you don't change your physiology, you won't get anything. So an incantation is not only you speak it, but you embody what you're saying with all the intensity you can. And you do it with enough repetitions that it sticks in your head. Like it's a small world, now the conversation in your head is always the same and it gives you what you want. So you use your body and your voice. So 17 years ago, I started doing things. I was working for Jim Rohn, this speaker. And I was 17 years old. I had long hair, minestrone soup, acne on my face. And I was trying to call on Bear Stearns type of people and convince them why they should go to this man's seminar and be more successful. I was driving a 1968 Volkswagen and I had earned it $40 a week as a janitor. The only way I did it was park far from the building, 
and then go in and I love people and I believe, but I put myself in state and I was able to influence people that were far more successful than I was at the time. I would do something that I still do backstage and have done for 20 years because I don't hope I'm going to be in good state. I demand it. So I do an incantation using my whole body. I'd say, I now command my subconscious mind to direct me in helping as many people as possible alive today to better their lives by giving me the strength, the emotion, the persuasion, the humor, the brevity, whatever it takes to show these people and get these people to change their lives now. And I would do that literally driving in my Volkswagen to a meeting in LA on the freeway for 40 minutes. People are looking, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. They're going, I know he's a serial killer. I know he is. But by the time I entered that room, when two people meet, if there's rapport, the person who's most certain will always influence the other person. And I was totally certain, and they were trying to get revved up to certainty. Do you agree with this, yes or no? I do another one, because I was poor, I changed my mindset. I kept doing things, but I never got beyond it. I'd say God's wealth is circulating in my life. His wealth flows to me in avalanches of abundance. All my needs, desires, and goals are met instantaneously by infinite intelligence. For I'm one with God and God is everything. And I would imagine the abundance of my life and I would feel so grateful. And a year later I went from making $38,000 a year to making a million dollars a year in one year. There is another level. The only reason you keep seeing there isn't is you feel so exhausted about where you are. But life, the universe, or God is just testing you because there is another level. If this is good, giant jump to excellence, giant start good, poor to good to excellence. There's a level where all your dreams are realized. There's a level that you've always dreamed about. It is real. It has not gone away. But it takes that extra burst when you think there's nothing left. There's no way. You've tried everything 10 million times and you keep going. It's almost like God is saying, if you keep hitting this wall enough times, I will see that you will not stop, that you are filled with that level of determination, faith, and courage. And then the door opens and you get to that next level. But what most people don't know is the next level is just two millimeters above. And it's called outstanding, ladies and gentlemen, outstanding. What's it called? What's it called? What's it called? Outstanding, magnificent, unstoppable, extraordinary, not excellent. It's a different level. It's a level where you are not one of the best, you are the best. And you know what's amazing? You only have to be two million years more than everybody else and you get everything. You get the joy, the laughter, the fun, the family, the passion, the economics, the freedom, the spirit. It's all there. What Jerry Maguire called the quad, baby. All of it. And it's just two million years above and most excellent people give up because they're exhausted. And there's some people who go, the harder I hit it, the more I hit it, sooner or later it's going down. I'm not stopping. And when you do that enough, it pops open. you a leader is your ability to make a decision. Who's with me on this, right? And anybody can make the easy decision, right? So what makes you a leader is you can make the tough decisions. And what makes you a leader is you make the decision. What makes you a great leader is you know, I may be wrong, but if I have to wait till everything's resolved, nothing's going to get resolved. So I'm going to make a decision. If I make a decision and it's wrong, I'll find out quicker than if I sit on the fence while my life goes by. I remember I, I, I've shared this with maybe a few of you before, but uh, years and years ago, when we had the big Gulf War, generals, you know, uh, Norman Schwarzkopf's a friend of mine, passed away a few years ago. And I used to bring him in to talk about leadership. And one of the first times I ever asked him, I said, how do you define leadership? You know, how do you know when a person's really a leader? And he said, well, they can make decisions. And he said, I can remember when I was, he was an assistant to a, to a general. And I forget what the exact position is, but he said, he was responsible for reading all the briefs. And this general is one of the highest generals in the army. And there was a decision that needed to be made and had to do with 10 years of going back and forth with the Pentagon, trying to figure out if they're gonna make, go one direction or another. It was a gigantic decision that was gonna affect the way the army was structured and how money was gonna be divided, what resources were gonna go where. And he said, they brought in this group of 20 people in and they had this two hour meeting and everybody got up and pitched their side of what they thought was right. And at the end, when it was completely done, the general said, has everyone said their piece? He said, yes. He said, do this. It was plan A or plan B, whatever it was, out of the three choices they had. And everybody said, okay, okay, general, you know, saluted him and ran off to go implement this thing. 
And, and Schwarzkopf said he was freaking out because he knew there's no way that general could have read everything even he'd read. And this was such a complex piece and there was only two hours and everybody gave their best, but oh my God, there's so many things to consider. And so he finally he got up enough courage, he said, to go to the general and said, General, so he said, permission to speak freely. He said, ease, speak freely. He said, General, there is so much information here and there's so much here and no one's really gonna know for sure. How the hell could you just make that decision like that? He said, because someone had to make it. He said, because it's been going around for 10 years back and forth and no one being able to make a decision. He said, what if you're wrong? He said, if I'm wrong, we'll find out quicker. And if I'm right, the job will be done. Next question, right? It's like when you're put in charge, take command. Everyone in this room knows how to create. You're not a manager of your life, you're a creator of your life or you wouldn't be in this room. How do you create your life? You get hungry for something, don't you? Who has done something in your life that once seemed difficult or impossible and now it's part of your life? Who's got something in your life in this area? Say I. How did you do it? You created it three ways. Number one, you decided there's something you wanted so bad that you unleashed all your desire. You became obsessed with it. If it was a business or a car or a relationship or a transformation in your body, if there's something you once envisioned and now it's real, it's because you didn't just envision it, you brought so much emotion to it that now it's in your life. It was once a dream, it was once a goal, and now it's in your life. How many have something like that in your life now? Say I. You may take it for granted now, hopefully not, but it was once just a vision. It may have seemed impossible at one time. So how did you do it? You started with a concrete vision of what you wanted and you focused on it continuously, didn't you? Wherever focus goes, energy flows. You envisioned something, you got clear about it, and then you started thinking about all the reasons why you wanted it. You got excited about it. You said, this is what's next for me now. I want this. You may have dreamed about it, thought about it, talked about it, but when you focus on something continuously, something magical happens. You get insights, don't you? You overhear a conversation and you hear something you wouldn't have heard if you didn't have that outcome or goal that you wanted so badly. Who's ever come up with something, obsessed about it, didn't even know how to do it, and it just happened and it came together? Who's had that experience? Say, I. So why don't we tap into that power now for your business and life? The day that I became wealthy, I'll tell you the day, I know that day I was rich. I was broke, I was pissed, I was angry at everybody else but who? Myself, but really underneath it, I was mad at myself, I just couldn't beat myself up anymore, so I was pissed and I had a friend that I loaned money to when I had barely enough and I knew he needed it and I gave him $1,200 and I'm here not able to eat, I'm down to like $25, $26 and I'm saying to him, calling him and he's not returning my call. And I just need some money and he's ignoring me. I didn't ignore him then, so I'm pissed, I'm frustrated. In the midst of all this, I'm also pragmatic. I got 25 and change, call it $26. What the hell am I gonna do? I don't have any plans for economics. I got overhead that's crazy. I'm living in this little tiny apartment, 400 square feet in Venice, California. So I thought, okay, when I was totally broke early on when I was 17, I used to save my money up and go to the smorgasbord and load up for Christmas, you know, load up for the week. So I said, I was in Venice, I'm gonna go over to Marina del Rey where all the yachts are and there's a place there called El Torito and I'm gonna go, they have an all you can eat smorgasbord, I'm gonna load up for the winter, I'm gonna get there. So I didn't drive there because I wasn't gonna spend the gas to get there, plus I needed to walk, so I walked there. And I go in, I'm not dressed really great, but it's Marina del Rey, it's okay. And I got a place right by the window and I can see these yachts going by and I'm dreaming of what life could be like. And I'm starting to le let go of my anger and I'm starting to start focus on what I want instead of what I don't want. How many follow? Say I. And that shifted me just a bit. And now I'm eating, which shifted me a lot. And I got this giant plate stacked up and I don't know what the amount was. It was like, whatever, it was 695, 795, right? So. I'm gonna do this, I could probably do this three or four times, right? Somewhere in that range. As I'm finishing my meal, this little boy comes in, dressed in a little suit, and I honestly don't know how old he'd be, probably in the third grade, so maybe eight years old, nine years old, something like that. 
and he was so adorable. And he opened the door for his mother. His mother was an attractive lady. And he came over and he pulled out the seat for her and she sat down. And I was, she was a pretty lady, but as pretty as she was, I was totally obsessed by this boy. He was just, he had presence at seven or eight years old. And it moved me. I don't know why, it just, it moved me. And I thought, this kid is like pure. He's, I want him to always be this way. He's such a good kid, he's a giver. So I got up and I paid for the meal and whatever it was, six, seven bucks. So now I've got whatever left, 17, 18, 19 dollars. And I walk up to this little boy and I said, excuse me. And I said, I just want to acknowledge you for being such an extraordinary gentleman. I said, I saw the way you treated your lady, how you opened the door, how you pulled the chair out. I said, that's class. I said, my name's Tony, what's yours? I don't honestly remember his name, Charlie or something. And he looked up at me and I said, Charlie, I said, that's amazing taking your date out for a lunch like this. He goes, well, actually, she's my mom. And I said, that's even more cool. And, I, and he said, oh, but I, I'm not taking her lunch because I'm just, I think he said he was eight. I said, oh, yes, you are. And I had no plan for this. I just reached in my pocket. I took all the money I had left, 17, 18, 19 dollars, and I put it on the table. I said, you're taking her to lunch. He looked up at me and he goes, I can't take that. I said, sure you can. He said, why? Because I'm bigger than you are. And he smiled real big, and I didn't even look at his mom. I just turned and walked away. And I didn't walk out of that door. I flew home. I should have been freaking out. How the fuck am I going to eat? But I didn't. I flew because something inside of me had finally got past scarcity. I finally realized there's something inside of us more than our limits, especially around this thing called money that I had let terrorize me. And I got home and the mailman came that day and I had no idea I was gonna have my next meal. And a letter comes and it's from the guy I loaned the money to. Handwritten notes saying, I've been avoiding you. It's wrong, I'm so sorry. You were there when I needed you. Here's what I owe you plus a little bit more. And the 1200 was there, plus another 100 for the time that I had to take care of it. And for me, $1,300, that was enough to like run my show for a month or two. And I cried. And then I decided, what does this mean? And I thought, this means that whenever you give, it's always going to come back. So you don't have to ever think about that again. Just give. And the rewards will be greater than you can ever imagine. I don't know if that's coincidence, but I decided to believe that day was a blessing when I became rich. And I can tell you honestly, I've had tough days in my life, economically, emotionally, like all of us, but I've never gone back to that scarcity. I never will. The secret to living is giving. Do it when you don't have it. And I promise you, scarcity will leave your life. Steve's a dear friend of mine, and when he was building the win, I'll never forget. He was at my home in Sun Valley. I'd just gotten to meet him. It was New Year's, and everybody else was standing and watching the fireworks, and I was sitting at the table, and I was basically doing a brain melt, sucking out of his brain everything I possibly could. How do you think about this? What do you do? How do you market? And here's what I learned from Steve. People don't buy products. They buy feelings. People don't buy products. They buy states. People don't buy products. They buy identities. And he and I went back and forth for about two and a half or three hours and became lifelong friends the last decade and a half. He came to this seminar, sat in the front row, and I'm not, there's almost nothing that makes me uncomfortable, but I'm like, what am I gonna teach him? But he sat in this event at lunch, took me to lunch, and he goes, this is the most viable session I've been in the last 10 years. I know what I'm gonna do. This is in 2008. He said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to, when all my competitors are shrinking right now, because they're trying to survive, I'm gonna go build this giant beach club that goes right to Las Vegas Avenue. I'm gonna build this new entrance. I'm gonna up my services. He said, I'm gonna do what you teach. What is the fundamental success to becoming wealthy? It's only one thing. If you wanna be wealthy, you have to do more for your clients than who? Than anyone else. You have to add more what? That is the entire secret to wealth in business. You want it in one sentence, it's simple. Do more for others than anyone else is doing. Add more value and you will own them and you will own the marketplace.
He goes, you know what I'm going to do, Tony? I'm going to, when everybody else is shrinking, I'm going to add more value. So all the high-end people are going to see I'm doing more and they're going to come to me. And this down period is going to be the most important period of my entire career. Because when the economy comes back and those guys start giving services, I already own these people. They're not going to leave me. I'm their home. You got to ask yourself, what do I do to add more value? And many of you think adding more value means cutting your prices or doing something of that nature. Sometimes adding value is raising your price. That's crazy. Raising your price can increase your sales if it's the right piece. Now, if you raise your price and do more, no question that could be the right thing in some cases. Some of you, your market is the cheapest price. Maybe it's time to change that business model because unless you're Walmart or Amazon or somebody that can do things at massive volume and lose money and sustain it, you might need a thing called a margin. If you're going to be successful in business, you want a high margin. High margins come from high human needs being met. Only way to deal with fear that I found in my life is a couple ways. One of those ways is to turn it on itself and ask yourself, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid of that. I got to be more afraid of what I'm going to miss out on, missing out on my mission, missing out on who I'm supposed to be. Missing. In other words, if you're not going to get rid of fear, then use fear. Use fear or it uses you. It's that simple. So you gotta say, okay, what's the price if I just stay doing this? What's the price? What, I need to really even get scared if I learn all this and I don't follow through. That's something to be scared about. And then that fear will get you over your fear. It'll push you through. Turn fear on itself. Second way you can do it is use what you've probably heard me say because I've used it since I was 17, is my little rocking chair test, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit myself in my rocking chair and I'm, I'm 85 years old and looking back on my life and I say, I didn't do this or I did. Talk about the art of fulfillment. What I explain to people always is, I didn't say science of fulfillment. Why not? Because it's different for everyone, just like art. What one person thinks is beautiful, somebody else might think is ugly. So if you want to know what's beautiful, as many people there are on earth, it's an art because everyone has a different view. If you want to know what God loves, the universe loves, go to the forest and see it. It's called massive diversity. It isn't a science, it's an art. But that art, unmastered, will create an ugly life. An ugly life. And the phrase I use most often, that I hope you've heard me say, and you take it in once again, maybe deeper is, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. But if we don't physically make a decision how we're gonna live, then we'll show up like everybody else because the human mind is not gonna make you happy. This brain of yours won't do it. You have to direct it. And there's no worse fate than to achieve everything and not be fulfilled. How many have had the days where you achieved this huge goal and your brain always wanted it and you got it and then your brain went, is this all there is? Who's been there? It's the worst experience. It's worse than failing, isn't it? Because most of you are achievers, so failure never stops you. You just look at it as a little bump on the road. I'll try something, what? But when you succeed and you fail, when you succeed and you're not fulfilled, that's scary. Here's what leaders really do. They maximize resources. A leader can come into an organization that's totally torn up in horrible shape, take the same resources, take it to another level. Your body, your mind, your emotion, but you can't maximize it when you're trying to fit in. And you can't maximize it when you live by everybody else's rules. I'm not saying don't be respectful. I'm just saying as a leader, you've got to decide what you believe is right. And one thing I can tell you will always feel right, to never settle for less than you can be, do, share, or give whole life is shaped by decisions. That's what we've talked about today, right? But there's three decisions you're making every moment you're alive. And the way you make these three decisions shapes your destiny. First decision we're all making every moment is what are you going to focus on? What are you going to focus on? And you know, I realized that my father's life and my life ended up very different because we made that day three decisions very differently. He decided to focus on the fact that he has not fed his family. And the second question you gotta decide, every moment you're alive, including this moment, what are you gonna focus on? The second question is, as you're focusing on, what does this mean? What does it mean?
the bottom line on meaning is, if you think about it, you get to make up the meaning, and most people pick the worst one, don't they? That day, my father decided to focus on the fact he hadn't fed his family, and I know what meaning he gave because he said it out loud over and over again, that he was worthless because he had not taken care of his family. And then the final and most important decision you make every moment you're alive, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I'll tell you what he decided to do. He decided to leave our family shortly thereafter, which at the time was... It was the worst experience of my life. It was the most crushing experience I felt. It's been so many years now, I don't have the same feelings. And part of it is three years ago, he passed away. But at the time, I knew no greater pain. My family knew no greater pain. I couldn't understand why he would leave. I loved him so much. And my life turned out very different than him. I was the only one to go to his funeral. No one else in the family would go. Nobody wanted to be part of it. He died alone of a disease called connective tissue disorder. And I can tell you right before his death, he got the lesson because he looked at me and he said, son, he said, I was a bastard. I didn't connect with anybody and look what I'm dying of. It's unbelievable. Well, we're living in a society where nobody moves anymore. What are we like today? How do people get injured today? They don't get injured smashing into people, playing football, and anything else. They get injured typing, right? You know, picking up a pencil. Oh, oh, they're really, oh. That's how people get hurt today because we don't use everything anymore. We live in a box. Think about it. Think about our lives today and how different it is than maybe the way we were formed to be made. To run, to hunt, to create, to procreate, to raise our children, to move, to farm, to do all the things that made us use all of our body. Today, what do we do? You wake up and you have this box life. You have a box breakfast, right? You get in your box car, you drive to your box office, you float up a box elevator. You don't use the stairs, of course, right? You go to your box office where you type on a box, talk on a box, right? Go into a box room for meetings, right? Sure enough, got a little box you can type on, listen to, listen to music on, box, have your box lunch, Drive your box home or get in the train or subway and another box home. Get home to your box and then turn on the box. <laughs> Type on a box, message on a box. I mean, and maybe go get a cylinder to change your state. <laughs> right? <You> know, maybe. <laughs> and most people's idea of exercise in our society today is fill the tub, pull the plug, and fight the current. <laughs> no, like, that, that's the world we live in today. Whenever you don't learn, it's because someone is trying to teach you in a different way. And the different way is, I, I was a good student in school. I liked learning. Until I got to junior high school, high school, where I liked all subjects until I got to there, when math became algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. Because when I got there, I totally hated it. So I had no motivation to really learn it. And with no drive to learn something, you don't. But then secondly, since I wasn't driven, it was also the class that usually had the most homework. And if you didn't end the homework and you came in the next day, it was like being in a foreign language class. The hypotenuse of X, Y, Z over, and I'm, all I'm hearing is, oh, that, 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 ah, ah, oh, yeah. My brain's searching, going, I don't know what that is. So then I would raise my hand to ask a question, which is not a good thing to do in that environment. So I'd say, well, what is a hypotenuse of the blah, blah. And they go, oh, that you don't know? That's really like, that you don't know. So if you want to learn something, if you're not learning, it's not that you're not smart. It's not that you can't figure it out. It's that the person is explaining it using references you don't have. So I've learned things like quantum physics. I've learned things like nuclear power from physicists. I'll say, okay, explain to me how that's like an orange, <laughs> right? How's that at least like a solar system? Something I understand. And sure enough, once they make that linkage, you got it. You understand the relationship, you understand what things are.